So we've covered all the existing paradigms of business cycle research. ISLM paradigm, so disequilibrium paradigm, real business cycle paradigm, and the new Keynesian paradigm. Um, now let's try to uh, articulate them in time and to see how we moved, how the community of uh, macroeconomists moved from one to the other um, using the idea of the scientific cycle that was proposed by Kuhn. So uh, Kuhn proposed that we always alternate between periods of normal science when one paradigm is universally accepted to period of revolutionary science when um, different paradigms uh, you know, compete with each other um, because the paradigms that existed before um, suffered from some anomalies that were not easily solved to a new period of normal sense when a new paradigm is adopted. So let's try to see a little bit how we can use that idea of scientific cycle um, to understand the evolution of business cycle uh, models. So the first paradigm that we uh, discuss is, is ISLM. So what was the reason for the genesis of ISLM? That's very clear. It is uh, the Great Depression. The Great Depression happened in Europe, in the US, between 1929 and the early 30s, and that really, that's what prompted uh, Keynes to write the general theory. Uh, and then in 1936, uh, and then Hicks in 1937 interpreted the general theory in terms of the ISLM framework. But it's clear what, where the impetus came from. Um, this was um, the Great Depression. And that pushed uh, Keynes and Hicks um, to develop the ISLM framework. So that ISLM framework, the Keynesian framework, um, you know, prevailed the 30s, 40s, 50s, in the 60s. Um, it was um, very widely, you know, universally uh, accepted. Uh, but there was a big change in the late 60s and in the 70s. Um, when the disequilibrium uh, framework appeared. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of uh, timeline, so here, as I said, uh, ISLM, that was really from the 1930s all the way to the 1960s. So this equilibrium framework prevailed or was very active um, in the 1970s, um, um, although there were some attempts at building a disequilibrium framework as early as the mid uh, 60s with work by uh, Patinkin and Clover um, that were really trying to uh, to build that framework. So what what was the impetus? So, you know, the 70s were a period of normal, normal sense for the disequilibrium paradigm. From the 30s to 60s, you had a period of normal science for the ISLM paradigm. And so basically in the late 60s, early 70s, you had a period of revolutionary science where we there was a big shift from ISLM to the disequilibrium uh, framework. And so what, what, was, what were the forces that pushed people you know, to build this disequilibrium model and then the community to adopt this model? Well, it's easy to see what we can do is turn to the one of the main textbooks of the disequilibrium paradigm, which I've already mentioned. Uh, money, Employment, and Inflation by Baron Grossman. So we talked about it a bit earlier, this textbook. And so you can just look at the uh, motivation and the, the preface, and they explain very clearly what they see as the limitations 
of ISLM and what they want to bring to the table. Uh, and so their main issue, um, as I write it, is that they are worried about the weak foundations of con conventional macroeconomic analysis. And by that, they mean ISLM, which was the dominant paradigm at the time. Um, and so what they really want to do is to provide a stronger foundation, what we call now micro foundation. And what they say is that they want to uh, understand the interrelation between the behavior of individual economic agents and the realization of microeconomic phenomena. What they want is to rework the theory of microeconomic relations through re-examination of their microeconomic foundation. So for them, it was um, very clear. Um, here, it wasn't really that there were empirical anomalies with ISLM because the disequilibrium model will have a lot of the same properties, but it was more of a methodological disagreement. What they wanted is to bring solid micro foundation to recapture the ideas of ISLM. Um, so here's a push to move from ISM to the equilibrium. And the reason why the community adopted the disequilibrium uh, framework is that it was providing you know, a better uh, methodology. And in a sense, with that better methodology, with this micro foundation, the model was um, very economical. This ISLM uh, framework had you know, evolve and become quite cumbersome. People were using very large microeconomic models in the 60, 60s um, to understand the economy. These models had become quite huge with many, many equations describing different markets and so on. Um, the disequilibrium model, as we discussed, is just a simple two market model, um, the product and labor market. So it's quite compact um, and tries to provide micro foundation like this. So, uh, in a sense, a, a big advantage of that model was that it was much more economical than the kind of ISLM, large ISLM model that existed at the time. Um, but so the, the motivation for it was to provide better micro foundation. And so this equilibrium was quite successful because it had provided you know, micro foundation to the ISLM ideas. So next um, in time, the next paradigm uh, after the disequilibrium paradigm, as we've discussed, what's the real business cycle um, paradigm? And so the real business uh, cycle paradigm, so the foundational paper is uh, Kidland and Prescott. 1982, um, and very quickly after that, the real business cycle paradigm took over and was adopted by the uh, community. Um, so that's really um, the 1980s. It was uh, ve very popular the 1990s, and I think all the way to the end of the 2000s. And so, um, what was the motivation for moving from this equilibrium to really business cycle. Um, and, you know, so today people say, well, you know, the people in the real business cycle tradition, they wanted to have um, clearing market, um, they wanted to have rational agents, they wanted to have micro foundation, but the people in the disequilibrium tradition also had rational agent, rational households, rational firms, they also at micro foundation. So that's not really, they also had a Valhazian assumption, although they assumed uh, fixed prices, but there was a lot more similarity actually between these two traditions. Um, so, but actually at the time, the real business cycle people, they sold their contribution differently. And again, if you turn to the uh, main textbook of the real business cycle um, school of thought, uh, which is the frontiers of business cycle research. And you go to chapter one, which is titled Economic Growth and um, Economic Growth and Business Cycles. One of the co-authors uh, is uh, Ed Prescott, who wrote the main paper that started the real business cycle literature. And what they wrote here, they have a very simple explanation for what they are trying to do. And they say, modern business cycle theory, so by that they mean real business cycle theory, 
starts with a view that growth and fluctuations are not distinct phenomena to be studied with separate data and different analytical tools. Um, so what they want to do is build a model that captures both short-term economic fluctuation and long-term growth. That's the motivation. And in fact, if you look at the abstract um, of the Kidland and Prescott paper in Econometrica 1982 that started the real business cycle literature, the first sentence of the abstract is the equilibrium growth model is modified and used to explain the cyclical variances of a set of economic time series. The covariances between real output and the other series and the auto covariance of output. So really, the way this uh, the way this was framed is that we wanted to have a unified treatment of growth and fluctuation. And in fact, the NBR group, that's the home of the real business cycle people or former real business cycle people, is called economic fluctuation and growth. So this says it all. Um, so the main motivation at the time is let's try to have a unified treatment of growth and fluctuations. So growth, which is long-term growth, and then short-term fluctuations. And then once this is understood, it becomes clear why all the assumptions that are made by the real business cycle literature are made. So for instance, because they start from a solo growth model, it's natural that all prices are flexible. It's natural that you have Valrasian uh, market. It's also natural that you uh, think a lot about uh, technology or productivity because that plays a key role in growth. So once this is understood, it's clear why the assumption of the real business cycle literature are made. And so real business cycle literature was very active for uh, you know about uh, 30 years. And so then we know that the paradigm that came after the real business cycle paradigm is a new Keynesian paradigm. Um, so, you know, the new Keynesian paradigm, the foundational papers, you have um, Blanchard and Kiyotaki, that's 1987 in the AER. You have uh, Miles Kimball paper, 1995 uh, in GMBC. Uh, so, you know, it really became very active in the 1990s all the way. And today it's clearly the dominant uh, paradigm in macro. And so you can see that in the 1990s and 2000s, real business cycle models, or real business cycle paradigm was still active. The new Keynesian paradigm was active. So that was clearly 1990s and 2000s was clearly a period of, if you want, revolutionary science because there was a fierce competition between the two schools of thought um, for uh, dominance. And eventually the new Keynesian paradigm took over and so again, it's interesting to try to understand like what was the motivation for building a new Keynesian model and what pushed people to build this model. And here again, it's interesting to turn to the main textbook of that school of thought. So uh, we can look at the uh, book by uh, Mike Woodford, which is um, the Bible of the new Keynesian uh, school of thought. So that's uh, Woodford's textbook. And we can look again at the preface to try to understand what was the motivation for um, writing this book and building these models. And it's very clear there are two things that Woodford wants to improve on compared to the real business cycle model. Um, so again, there's a mention of trying to have reconciling microeconomic with microeconomic theory. So this is something that the disequilibrium guys mentioned, the real business cycle guys mentioned. So that's not really new. But one is Woodford wanted to understand the temporary departure from an efficient utilization of existing productive capacity that result from slow adjustment of wages and prices. So first, you know, the, this idea that yes, over the cycle, there may be inefficiencies. Productive resources are not fully utilized. So we want to understand why that's the case. And two, he wanted to have a framework that would um, help understand 
you know, what central bankers do and help guide uh, monetary policy. Um, so he said, you know, we want to reconcile central bankers' understanding of what they do with the way that monetary policy is conceived in theoretical monetary economics. Um, so really trying to understand inefficiencies and then have a model that allow you to think about monetary policy. This was a big motivation. And, um, you, you know, it's, re it's really on the strength of these two motivations that the framework took over. Because, of course, some, um, if we want to help central bankers and understand monetary policy, which a lot of microeconomies want to do, you really need to have a model that can speak of that monetary policy needs to be non-neutral, you need to have some price rigidity. So that that's really was a key argument uh, in favor of the new Keynesian model. Similarly, a lot of people realize that in recession, when you have a lot of unemployment, which is not in the, in the new Keynesian model, but it really seems to have big market failures in recession. And so you want to have a model that can allow, help you think about that, which the real business cycle couldn't help you do. And so that really also helped the new Keynesian uh, school of thought take over and dominate. Um, so two things that really helped the new Keynesian framework during this period of competition, the 90s and 2000. One is that the model allows you to think about uh, market failures, or if you want, inefficiencies in the allocation of resources. That's one thing. And two, the model allows you to think about monetary policy. So money is non-neutral in the model. You can think about optimal monetary policy and so on. And so uh, thanks to that, you can then model to cover. And now we have a model that you know, can, uh, that features uh, market failures and uh, non-neutral uh, non money. 